Hello, my name is Tall Lanky Guy, and today I'd like to talk to you about therapy. But before I do that, I'm going to make a couple very important disclaimers. First, I am not a licensed therapist. I did not go to doctor school. I am just a guy who enjoys going to therapy and talking about artsy fartsy video games. Second, because we're going to be talking about therapy and therefore mental health, I'm putting out trigger warnings for anxiety, depression, and suicide. It's subtle, but it's there. And thirdly, if it weren't already obvious, this will contain spoilers for the game Super Liminal. Enjoy. Ready, set, go. If y'all pay me enough, I will absolutely record this entire essay in that voice. Side note, is it just industry standard to be drinking some kind of alcoholic beverage while also filming? Not complaining. If you're not familiar with it, Superliminal is a perspective-based puzzle game developed by Pillow Castle Games with music by Matt Christensen. It's about therapy, but it should go without saying that this game is not in any way a suitable substitute for going and speaking with a real trained professional therapist. But what's particularly impressive about this game, other than the extremely fascinating and fun puzzle mechanics, the fantastic soundtrack, and the beautiful art style, is that they've actually worked therapeutic principles not only into the narrative of the game, but into the puzzles themselves. It's subtle enough that by the time you arrive at the final sequence, you've navigated the various incarnations of perception-based puzzles, pressed through times of confusion and fear, and grown in confidence until you reach the end, which brings it all together. Hello, Hi. my name is Dr. Glenn Pierce. Hi, Glenn. And I'd like to talk to you about being special. The game starts to sneak its therapy in fairly early via the presented narrative of the game, which convinces you that you've somehow found the back halls of the dream program. For some players, particularly those familiar with fourth wall breaking stories like The Truman Show and The Stanley Parable, the notion that they've made their way outside of the set course is pretty exciting. For others, it might be a concerning indicator of what might go wrong now that protocol has been broken. And the game does communicate a sense of abstract danger in straying from the beaten path, hinting at things like explosive mental overload and the limits of the human subconscious. But what does this do to the mind of the player? It sets a sort of you-against-the-world, master-of-your-own-destiny tone. A combination of intrigue, independence, and isolation. Nice assonance there. Thank you. Good job knowing the difference between alliteration and assonance. Thank you. I went to story school. I can tell. The Forge A New Path narrative makes you feel like an exceptional person. Anyone else would have just carried on with the regularly scheduled programming, but this time, they're dealing with you. They don't know you. They don't know what you're capable of. They didn't expect you to knock down that wall with that cheese. You are the patient they were not prepared for. This narrative ego boost carries you forward like a hubris fueled jet engine through the tutorial phase of the game to the first stereo where Dr. Glenn P.H. Daddy Pierce tells you we have no idea where you are. And that's exactly what he wants you to think. The game has now established a relationship between you and it that very much resembles the relationship many people have with therapy. I'm sure it works just fine for most people, but I'm not most people. I'm so special, they won't know what to do with me. Hello, my introductions are redundant. I am a real doctor who went to doctor school. Rather than challenge the you can't handle me attitude and immediately prove the player wrong, Dr. Pierce plays a long game. Not too long though, Superluminal doesn't take more than a few hours to finish. 
Dr. Pierce's recordings lean into the player's skepticism towards his dream therapy protocols to the point of ridiculousness. He boasts that the system of emergency elevators will get you back on track. Will all of this work? Absolutely. And he gives strange contingency plans for very specific crises. For example, if you see your parents, please punch them in the face as hard as you can and immediately run away. His recordings are often redundant or irrelevant, making pithy, meaningless commentary on mental health. There's a section in the game where some form of substantial encouragement would have really made a difference. Dr. Pierce notes that Despite touring the Waterfall Serenity Zone in the previous section you've just completed, you may still be experiencing feelings of worthlessness and self-doubt. Why do I feel like everything is going wrong, even when the sun is shining? And the recording ends before he gives an answer. As you enter the next hallway, the lights go out, and you discover evidence of a murderer lurking the halls of your dream. What looks like blood trails through the halls, and weekly schedules posted around with sinister itineraries. You tell yourself it might just be Sunday. Sunday is for beans. Partway through, Dr. Pierce returns with another rumination on your feelings of isolation, and once again ends the recording without any kind of real advice. Even when he does eventually give you advice, it's not particularly helpful at all. The worst thing you can do is focus on negativity. It won't spare you from the cage of death, the pain of disease, the cruelty of time, the cold shell of human nature, or the eventual loss of everything you've ever held dear. Whatever you do, don't focus on that. Hey Glenn, it's hard not to focus on negativity when there may or may not be a killer in my own subconscious, not to mention all of the terrifying implications from that possibility. But Dr. Pierce knows the player doesn't take him seriously, and so takes on the role of reflecting on the perceived faults of therapy that might make it seem like a waste of time. Too much faith is placed in a set program or curriculum that doesn't give you real answers to real problems and provides oversimplistic solutions to complex issues. You get the sense that Dr. Glenn Pierce isn't a bad guy. He just doesn't seem to know what he's talking about. The key word there being seen. Please note that I am the standard orientation protocol and that my voice has been explicitly chosen to remind you that I am not a part of your patient care team. I do not care. Lucky for you, Dr. Pierce isn't the only voice you hear in Superliminal. In fact, the first voice you hear in the game is that of the standard orientation protocol. Can I call you Mrs. Sop? The SOP makes it clear that they have no role in the dream therapy process, save for ensuring that you follow the set procedures necessary to maximize the program's effect. And maybe it's the fact that she reminds me of another passive-aggressive female robot. The SOP is the closest that Superliminal comes to having a real antagonist. Especially since the murderer was never real. You just saw splashes of red paint and some well-placed props. If you take the time to check out the boarded-up room in the tutorial section, it's her voice, not Dr. Pierce's that orders you to return to schedule and lightly threatens you with physical violence. Warning, you have deviated from the orientation pathway. Is that At the so? Pierce Institute, patient safety is a keynote in our corporate priority tetrahedron. A variable degree of force can and will be authorized to ensure patient safety. Please return to the orientation pathway. But the SOP's role in Superliminal is just a little more insidious than that. The SOP is the primary voice of dissent in Superliminal, not only chiding you for not following protocol, but recommending that you abandon the dream therapy entirely. She puts you between a rock and a hard place by both insisting that you stick to the script and claiming that the emergency protocols in place, Pierce's elevator system, do not work. 
at one point she recommends that you submit yourself to explosive mental overload. Hold of you to assume I didn't do that before coming to the clinic, ma'am. Eventually, the SOP gives up. The fact that you're still showing signs of fear, hopelessness, and frustration, apparently even more so than at the start, contradicts the SOP's theory that the dream therapy causes a decrease in these emotions. So she gives up and assigns you to continue with somnasculpt therapy indefinitely on an independent basis as all orientation resources have been exhausted. You might as well go to therapy forever because there aren't any other options. These sentiments make the SOP an external expression of the very common concerns that people can have when they first start going to therapy. They don't actually care about me, I'm just their patient. Is it my fault that I don't feel better? Would it be better for me to just self-destruct? Of course, nothing is more challenging than the difficulty of changing perspective. So I've been talking a lot about the story of Superliminal and not much about the puzzles themselves. The puzzles are functionally the in-game therapy, in the sense that with each room you take time to slightly alter your perspective to what is possible in the game. With each new puzzle you are introduced either to a new perspective-based mechanic or at least a new way of utilizing the puzzle mechanics you've encountered previously. The principle isn't unique to Superliminal, of course, it's good practice in the end game to not only expand the player's abilities, but also build their confidence in said abilities. Particularly in puzzle games, though, the concept often goes unnoticed during gameplay. You don't grow in power, you've just been collecting ways to navigate around the obstacles of the game's world. You're not going for a high score, just a solution. While you know from the narrative that you're in a dream therapy program, you're also under the impression that the real therapy hasn't started yet. This is just the orientation. So while you're solving these puzzles, you're not thinking about what the puzzles mean, but you learn from them. They lull you into a suggestive state where you're absorbing information without awareness of it. And what information would that be? The puzzles in Superliminal are visualizations of how to process life. To be sure, that sentence in itself deserves its own video essay, but it's actually less ambitious than it sounds. The typical process for solving a puzzle in Superliminal follows thusly. Find where you're going, assess what you have available, then take what you need and adjust your visual perspective to get you where you need to go. In some rooms, you have to adjust the significance of what you can see. In others, you need to allow curiosity to take you places that might not seem obvious at first. Sometimes you try and fill up an entire room with apples so they don't get blown away by a giant fan before realizing that you just need to angle the first apple as though it's on top of the button. And sometimes you need to see something or someone else achieve your goal before you can achieve it yourself. Making perspective a key element of the gameplay makes this game inherently philosophical. It's what the big kids call ludonarrative harmony, and it all slips under your nose on the first go. That is, until the moment it descends into chaos. From that point, you're thrown into a mad dash of puzzle traps collapsing floors, and unpredictable gravity shifts, an obstacle course that you could not have prepared for. Picking up objects randomly teleports you to different areas, and you're never given the time to process where you are or what's happening. All you can do is move forward as best you know how, until you find yourself in the Somnusculpt Diagnostic Framework. This puzzle is where you make the most important perspective shift in the game. You take the scale model of the clinic, which it turns out you're also currently inside of, and carry it into itself, 
causing a paradox that breaks down your surroundings and sends you to the final chapters of the game. Well, why would I call this the most important perspective change? Because the puzzle is about taking the clinic, a real tangible building in a real tangible parking lot, and placing it in the context of itself. Thus far, the world of Superliminal has felt detached from reality. It's a strange experimental dream therapy program utilizing technology that feels exceedingly ahead of its time. But it's the act of taking the small, humble building and walking into the small, humble reception office that breaks down the pretense and leads you straight to the heart of the matter. Speaking of which... Hello, my name is Dr. Glenn Pierce, and many years ago, I had a dream. The second to last chapter in Superliminal is titled White Space and opens with Dr. Pierce recounting a dream he had a long time ago. White Space refers to a state of perceiving everything as we want to, unaffected and unfiltered by the biases and fears that life has inundated us with. Dr. Pierce's story is unexpectedly personal and honest but it also happens right when it needs to. In the previously mentioned puzzle, you took the Sonoscope Clinic and broke down its pretense by placing it in the world by acknowledging that the clinic, and thus the dream therapy program, is not just a high concept thought experiment for liberal arts students in burgundy sweaters to simp over while they fiddle with their goatees. Somnusculpt is inspired by the need for a space that not only accommodates for human perspective, but also offers new insights into human perspective. It is, as Dr. Pierce puts it, a place where a different point of view could make anything possible. This is what makes Superliminal such a well-crafted game, as well as the perfect vehicle for a story about therapy. All it requires of you is to be present in the moment and learn what it has to teach you. You don't need to be a pro gamer to complete and enjoy the game. There are no time limits or reflex puzzles, so you can take as long as you need to and probably get more out of it than some madman speedrunning it for video essay footage. Most of the puzzles have more than one possible solution, so you don't feel like you have to find the correct answer, just an answer that works for you. Superliminal accepts you as you are and allows you time and space to get through the game at your own pace. This is also the moment that Dr. Pierce brings the thematic context of the game back to the forefront. Up until this point, the game has been treating you, the player, as the in-game protagonist. But here, Dr. Pierce takes a moment to comment on your or your player character's current status. He infers on what brought us to therapy. We're here for a new perspective for our life. And we're better than a place where perspective is literally all you need to change reality. Hello. My name is Dr. Glenn Pierce, and by now, you may have realized that all of this has happened exactly the way it was supposed to. Are these section names or 2000s pop-punk song titles, am I right, people? <laughs> Alright. Anyway, remember when I said Dr. Pierce was playing a long game? This is where Glenn cashes in. The final chapter of the game has no puzzles and basically turns into a walking simulator where Dr. Pierce can deliver his ending message without too many distractions. Considering the general aesthetic of the game, I have no problems with that. As you walk, you're teleported backwards through each section of the game, allowing you to reflect on everything you've learned. And if the game hadn't been secretly feeding you puzzle therapy throughout, 
and Dr. Pierce's closing words might have landed a tad corny. Instead, he takes the final few minutes to recontextualize the entire experience. This is a game about reclaiming control of your life. You see, everyone who comes to the Institute does so because they feel that they are no longer in control of something important to them. Allowing yourself to fail. The problem is that we become so afraid of failure that we refuse to see our problems from a new perspective. And so we do the same things again and again and again. And therein, of course, we find exactly the failure we were looking for. Trusting your own wisdom and insight. Because you kept moving forward, no matter how far off the path you were told you were headed, or how unexpected it became, you found your way. And finding value in your own progress. But, just like the power of perspective itself, it will have been as real as you believed it to be. The game safely sends you through a whole range of emotions. From curiosity, to fear, to confusion, to comfort. In an effort to give you a sense of unhindered perception. The contrasting voices of Dr. Pierce and the standard orientation protocol put you in a position where you can decide for yourself how you feel during the program and congratulates you for questioning things. Also, I used to play bass for Dr. Glenn Pierce and the standard orientation protocol. By the way, some of the recordings from early in the game become really adorable when you realize that Dr. Pierce is really just making stuff up for you to be somewhat concerned about. His fake confidence in the elevators is particularly endearing. But what really gets me is, if you see your parents, please punch them in the face as hard as you can and immediately run away. All right, all right, Glenn. Thanks for the hot tip. And then the game closes with the words, all you've got to do is wake up. Alarm clocks are what we, in the artsy-fartsy industry, would call a motif in Superliminal. Most of the game's chapters start with you waking up to an alarm clock in a bedroom. When we think about what waking up means in the game, we realize that each time you wake up to that alarm is the game's way of saying, come on. It's time to realize your potential. I just think that's really sweet. Superliminal is not about confronting trauma or working through your flaws or anything that actually happens in therapy. It's about convincing you that those things are possible for you and worth trying. Waking up means realizing that the way you see things doesn't necessarily limit what's possible. At the beginning, you see signs that say perception is reality, which clue you into your new abilities in the dream program. It gives you hope in the fact that things can be changed in a way that they couldn't in the real world. But in the end, the same signs show up, but they've been written on with marker to say perception is not reality. If the way you see things is not the way you'd like to see them, that's okay. Because the way you see things isn't necessarily the way they are. The first sign tells you that reality can be however you perceive it. And the last sign tells you that reality doesn't have to be the way you see it. I hope you understand that. It doesn't have to make sense if you don't understand it, though. So don't sweat it too much. And that's our time. Thanks for coming in. I hope it was good for you. Be sure to grab a random soda on your way out. Hey, thank you so much for making it to the end of the video. I really appreciate it. Uh, this took a lot longer to make than I expected it to, but I'm also still trying to figure out my whole workflow process thing uh, when it comes to these video essays uh, in any case i'm really grateful for you for watching 
uh, and you can look forward to these video essays only getting better and better from here. Um, if you're new here, welcome. It's gr excuse me. It's great to have you. <laughs> Uh, we do, we do a lot of different things on this channel, uh, including but not limited to gaming, video essays, vlogs, um, yeah, just really anything that I feel like doing, you'll find it here. But it's mostly gaming. Um, if you haven't followed me on Twitch and you would like to see me play video games live as it happens, that's where you can do that. Um, yeah. Thank you so much to all of my editors. You are all beautiful human beings, and I value you and our friendship very, very much. Uh, this is usually the point where I would say uh, you can donate to my Patreon or become a member of the channel, but neither of those things are really uh, things that I can do right now. So uh, really all you can do right now to show your support is comment, let me know what you'd like to see, and uh, maybe come subscribe and follow me on Twitch. Other than that, thank you so much, and I'll see you later.